Please rise. <clears throat> Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's text is written in Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 18. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. So far, the holy word. I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in Christ at Our Saviors of Jamestown, North Dakota. And I bring you an important gospel message in his holy name, dear fellow redeemed. Today is Mission Festival. It's when we set aside time to contemplate uh, our foreign and domestic mission efforts do a review of what our church is doing to spread the good news of Christ crucified to the nations. It's a good time for us to remind ourselves what God's will is for the whole world. And to redouble our, our efforts here and abroad. It's also a good time to talk about the kinds of forces that may oppose our spreading of that gospel message. There are some threats and some enemies to uh, the gospel mission, uh, the idolatry, and the pagan gods. We witnessed some of them in our Bible class this morning as Pastor Fleischer shared slides from the mission helper trip. These things are very prevalent in many parts of the world, and the devil is surely still working through them and dragging many souls to hell. But I think for maybe us in the West, false idols are a little easier to spot, or maybe we're kind of cynical about them. Maybe it's not even a Western thing. I think about that episode in Daniel with King Nebuchadnezzar. He set up that false idol for all his subjects to worship, and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looked at it and said, that's not something we worship. We worship God, not a, not a golden image. It was easy for those three faithful men to recognize that their golden image was a false idol, not their true God. But around us, sometimes the devil uses trickier tra tactics. We may think about the false ecumenism of our country for decades. Uh, the spirit of ecumenism or the ecumenical movement. You know that word, it's a, it was a good word like so many words in the church, ecumenical was a good word, but it kind of gets misused. It really means to unite. But now the ecumenical movement seeks to unite people of all churches in a single unit. Do they accomplish this by careful study of the word? And by ensuring that all churches teach according to the doctrines of the Bible? Sadly, no. Quite the opposite. They unite by forgetting the true teachings of the gospel and by leaving doctrine to the side of the road. What's another thing that may challenge our efforts? What about uh, plain old animosity or hate? In many circles, you'll be laughed at if you confess a real historical Jesus who is really true God and really true man. Or if you believe that the Old Testament scriptures, including a six-day creation, or in our young earth, or if you deny evolution. Many of our children end up in public university somewhere along the line, and they'll be subject to this kind of ridicule from those who would teach them. Hundreds of uh, candidates for public office are spouting their positions and views on everything as the fall elections approach. Uh, Maybe we're very tired of hearing them. But I'll bet you couldn't get five of them together who would 
uh, publicly confess a six-day creation? Well, we have to answer this opposition. But we do it in a God-pleasing way. And Peter and John were dealing with people who, who thought they were the last word on religious matters. They were accused of being troublemakers for saying and doing what's right in the sight of God. What is right in God's sight? What pleases God? How can we please God? Today's text records an event in the lives of two of Jesus' apostles. They knew what was right in the sight of God. They knew that it was to preach to all nations, to share that open gospel message, the message that simply says God has done everything. He's taken away your sin in the form of His Son, Jesus Christ. Be reconciled, as Paul says in Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5. Oh, we have to back up a little bit and um, set the scene for today's text. Peter and John were going to the temple one day, and they saw a beggar there who could not walk. He wanted some money from them, and he had no means of supporting himself. And in Acts 3, Peter says, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. Of course, the man was miraculously healed. A 40-year-old man who had been lame from birth, Healed before the eyes of the people. And that was the right thing to do. They saw an opportunity, someone who needed help that they could provide, and also an opportunity to show the power uh, of Christ and of the one true God. Peter and John provided an example that day. They showed us how to, how to do what's right in God's sight. The right thing is to help our fellow man, and to give glory to God while we're doing it. How can we do what they did that day? Maybe in your community you see a lot of people who are in need, like that lame man. We know it's our privilege to help our fellow man in every way we can. Our state provides aid for the underprivileged and for the handicapped, which we support through our taxes as well. But if we were to meet the lame beggars on the side of the road... We could not instantly heal them and say, rise up and walk. We've not been given the spirit of healing the disciples had in those days, at least I haven't. But the example we get from them is not what they did, but how they did it. And when we take an, uh, advantage of the opportunity to serve, we should do it like the apostles did. They didn't hesitate. It would be tempting for them to pass by. The lame man, the disciples knew that they were in trouble already. They'd been drawing attention to themselves. And doing this miracle wouldn't be the opposite of that. It'd be the same thing. They'd draw more and more attention. They probably suspected they'd be uh, hauled before the Jewish high court, which is just what happens in our text for today. They might have suspected they could have been beaten or thrown in jail or worse. Uh, look at what had happened to Jesus only a few months, a short time before. They didn't hesitate, though. They didn't stop to consider their own safety. They gave glory to the God they were proclaiming by performing that miracle. Do we hesitate? I can't speak for you, but I do. I failed in that area. Christians are often faced with the opportunity to do mission work in a very direct way by talking about Jesus and what he means to you in your life, to your neighbor. It happens at work. It happens at the playground. It happens at Walmart. Uh, and do you ever wonder why those occasions arise, why people ask you about your faith? Well, one reason is because Christians lead a sanctified life. Christians want to show their love to God by avoiding coarse talk and expressing concern for the well-being of others, by not gossiping. You just go down the Ten Commandments. That makes you a magnet of some kind. Your behavior itself. And when believers show these marks of a Christian, other people notice they became curious. They say, why don't you cuss and swear like the rest of us? Why are you always the one who looks out for the other guy? What makes you so special? Well, that's your opportunity to speak 
like Peter and John, and to do what's right in the sight of God. The apostles gave all the credit for that miracle of healing to God, and we should do the same. Someone asks you why you're friendly, or why you don't complain about your lot in life, and all the hard luck you've had, You could just shrug your shoulders and say, well, anybody would do what I did. But why not take advantage of that opportunity and say, you know, Jesus shed his blood for me and he died for my sins on the cross and any good works I do are out of love for him and reflect Christ outward. You could say Jesus died for your sins too. Sometimes it's what you don't do that makes people notice you. Why don't you join in with us when we pray? That's kind of a negative example, isn't it? A doctrine of fellowship example. A child, 10 years old, in one of my former congregations was happy to sing Jingle Bells in the winter program at the public school. But he stepped out, a 10-year-old. He stepped out for a silent night. He didn't find it difficult to tell the director why. He said, these kids are not all Christians. And many of us who are don't believe the same thing about Christmas. Why would we all worship together as if we all believe the same thing? The apostles had their chance too. They did the right thing that day. They did what was right in the sight of God. But our text shows that doing this right thing sometimes gets you into worldly trouble. Sometimes there are earthly consequences. After that miracle of healing that lame man, thousands were converted as the apostles preached Christ. And the rulers didn't uh, like that, of course, at all, the rulers of the Jews. They were turning from their traditional teachings, recognizing Jesus for the fulfillment of the prophecies they'd heard from the Bible. And that made the Sadducees angry because... They didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. You know that old saw about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. That's why they're sad, you see. Well, you can use that to keep them correct in your mind. Anyway, they had turned the religion of the true God into a religion of works. And they felt threatened by the apostles' teaching. So the Sadducees and the priests and the captain of the temple... Uh, They all arrested Peter and John and threw them in jail. And the next day they're dragged before the high priest and the rulers and the elders of the temple and the Jews wanted to know, by whose authority are you doing all these things? We're the ones, they said, that are supposed to have all the religious authority around here. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter told them he preached and performed miracles in the name of Christ, the Christ whom they had crucified A short time before, the Jewish leaders talked among themselves. They decided the solution was, we'll threaten the disciples. Maybe that would stop them from preaching and performing our miracles. And that's where our text picks up for today. We finally got to the text. How long is this sermon? It's not that much longer, but we have finally gotten to the text. Uh, Verse 18, they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Uh, They weren't even supposed to talk to each other now about Jesus, much less teach his name to the people. And these men who had arrested them, they were the rulers of not just the temple, but everyday life, the nation of Israel. They answered to the Roman governor, but they really held quite a lot of authority and could even recommend death. And these are the consequences. This was the payoff for the apostles doing the right thing. They preached Jesus, they healed a lame man, and they were attacked and thrown into jail. How does our situation compare? Do we face consequences of preaching Jesus? Not consequences like that, I don't think. At least not in our relatively free country. But there are earthly consequences. There's sometimes... A price to pay. You might feel squeamish about talking to your neighbor about Jesus because you think they might not respect you. Or you think that's a private thing. You know, religion and politics, you're not supposed to talk about those things. 
You may not want to bring up God's plan for salvation because it embarrasses you, but those inhibitions can be overcome. We can study the scripture. We can remember the Holy Spirit promises to be with us during these times, and we can speak up and witness to our neighbor. You know, the world may charge you with being far too religious. You should have an answer for them. The world may, in fact, say or imply that you spend too much money on church and not enough on yourself. The church or churches may try to tell you that breaking down the walls of doctrine to achieve unity is all that really matters. You should have an answer ready, an answer like Peter and John. Verse 19, Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard. The apostles said they have to preach the gospel. They don't have to apologize to the great and powerful Sanhedrin council. They didn't need to water down the gospel to make it more acceptable to the world. They explained boldly and politely that when it comes to sharing the good news, they had no choice. And it's our prayer that the Holy Spirit would give us the strength to make that our answer, too. God commands all believers to teach His Word. Matthew 28, 19 is often called the Great Commission because in it Jesus commands everyone should be told about Him. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And you know, the risen Jesus said the same thing, a similar thing to his disciples in Acts chapter 1. You shall receive power, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Sumeria and to the ends of the earth. Now this command of Jesus is also a promise that the Spirit would help them say what needed to be said. And that's what made Peter and John so brave. They were brave in the Spirit. And that's the same Holy Spirit that guides your pastor in the preparation of his sermon every week and gives him the words to say when he's thrust into a difficult situation. And these same commands of God apply to all of us. Like the apostles, we will face trials which might make us hesitate to share the good news with others. When we're figuring out our monthly budget at home, we will have a challenge of providing for ourselves and our families and supporting the work of missions through our church offerings and supporting our local outward-looking congregation as Berea is. We'll also stand accused by the world of hanging on to a message of hope that is 2,000 years old. We'll be accused, like Peter and John, of teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus. And like them, our answer, our swift answer should be, should we listen to the world or to God who rules the universe and loves us, even though we don't deserve it? We know that's the right thing to do. Our text tells us how we will be enabled to do the right thing and say the right thing. God not only commands us to speak what we've seen and heard, he gives us the power to do it. Christians can't help but share the good news of Jesus Christ crucified with their neighbors. Because it's such great news, it's the only religion that answers satisfactorily the question of sin. It's the only answer which puts the burden of our guilt completely on our crucified Savior. The gospel frees completely. It's not dependent on anything within man. The gospel liberates totally. And when we contemplate that, that merciful God who parted with his Son for our sakes, we'll want to share that good news, and that's why Peter and John said, we cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard. 
We know the world includes the heathen masses and also our neighbors across the fence. And the message is not some watered-down gospel. It's the entire scripture in its truth and purity. As the Lord said in Jeremiah, He who has my word, let him speak it faithfully. Paul told Timothy to hold fast the form of sound words and charge some that they teach no other gospel. The more we hear that message preached to us, the stronger our faith becomes, the more we'll want to share it with others. Are there sometimes some consequences even in our rather cushy world? Sure there are. There's always going to be persecution of one kind or another. But should we let that stop us? No, we cannot but speak the things we have heard and seen. Amen.